Humans don't mind being stupid as long as they can believe that theirs is a stupidity that is unique to them and that once again shows they are special amongst all the creatures here. I would say, think about it, but I fear you might, and thus magnify the aforementioned condition. A conscious man does not comment on the rain, and even the ordinary who do, do not actually speak on, of the wetness, but rather their relationship thereto. I keep telling you, it's a matter of verbs, not nouns. Headline, Awakening and the Perception of Distance. The further away something is thought to be, the less distinct it seems. But the eyes can play devilish tricks. There was once a mystic who entitled his daily lectures as, You know what I think? No, what do you think? Never mind. <laughs> and after each time giving the title, he'd announce his talk concluded. Some of one man's neurons had a song they'd sometimes sing to themselves. Oh, drugs make us thugs while leaving us alone. It's even worse. Based on our secret dictionary, the following. Psychiatry and all other forms of psychological counseling and treatments could be described as attempting to get a ghost to change clothes. Of course, going from that, you could say that religion is in, assume, is in assuring that better duds are only available after death. But hey, someone injects, where does that leave philosophy? Okay, then it would be in those half-dressed, debating whether or not nakedness is just an illusion. All mental preference is meaningless, which is why it must be continually discussed. A man went to a mystic and said, I have heard your public words to much profit, but would you explain to me something that I have noticed about you personally? To which the mystic replied, if I would explain anything about myself, then my words would not be worth your listening. Another scene whose only benefit is in your applying both sides of it, of the conversation to the one world of your own consciousness. People don't talk to mystics. Mystics talk to themselves. One man put his weight room in his library and moved his library into his weight room. When you comment on the packages that come to your house, you never fully take delivery thereof and are thus never totally satisfied therewith. Just picture it. A house full of stuff, only half there, and even that half, you're only half pleased to have. <laughs> In his daily address, a certain mystic once proclaimed, It is always the duty of every living mystic to denounce all mystics who have gone before him, and after a quiet pause, someone in attendance raised their hand and asked, Why? I do not know, the mystic replied. Although he did know, but knew not to answer anyone who asked. A man once presented a mystic with these words, If, as I've heard, the only good mystic is a dead mystic, then what should be my view of those I find alive and talking? The answer to that is more than self-evident and reassuring, is it not? The mystic replied, fully aware of the last part of his replies, annoyance factor. A man who once, on his own, became his own personal mystic, mused, it's always this and that, and when it's not, it's that and this. Picture this, a man inside a structure trying to break out, and outside another man trying to break in. The mind has no preferences unless comment thereon be made. 
A man asked a mystic, how many different ways are there of saying the same thing? As many as there are men in the world, he replied. One guy's latest favorite sayings is, life is easy to live, but hard to lead. Headline, an elucidation of the mind's attempt to describe another state of consciousness as opposed to the reality of same is exemplified by one man's comment. Quote, I'd rather be enlightened than be able to define what it is. <laughs> On one planet was once a race of creatures who had two separate brains and tongues, one of which could think and speak of mud and the other of being dirty. Needless to say, they went places. Daddy, I want to go places. Hush, child, and eat your pronouns. To compliment a more conscious man is to praise a portrait of him long after he's dead. Same as there are two basic realities, there are two ways to pay homage to a man. You can extol him or give him a sandwich according to which the realities you and him are dealing in at the moment. From the view of the few, one of the problems with the running inner commentary is that it constantly presents a fleeting, pre-digest, quick sketch of vague images which men come to accept as a full, detailed picture of things as they are. A situation doing no harm among the many, but for those attempting to awaken, it is a kind of shorthand to sleep land. While artistically, everyone understands that the music of a Bach can only be produced once by the original Bach and, after, and that later imitations, no matter how faithful, are never of equal interest. Many of those wishing to awaken fail to likewise realize that no awakening of anyone before them is subject to meaningful duplication. Let's make it simple. All mental preference is habit, nothing more. <laughs> Headline, magic for the moment. If you do not comment on intangibles, they cease to exist. Once upon a time, a man heard the statement, if you do not comment on intangibles, they cease to exist, and said to himself, that is foolish. Intangibles, by their very definition, do not exist. Then he thought on the matter a bit more and said, except for such matters as love, anger, approval, rejection, and such as that. He then pondered what he had just said a might further, and suddenly the true meaning of the statement struck him. If you do not comment on intangibles, they do not exist. Everyone in the world can have fun, or at least they know what it would take for them to have some, except for those wanting to awaken. What do you make of that, serious britches? But you know, really, the problem's not simply in being serious itself, but rather in knowing precisely what to be serious about. No, it's the hell not. The damn problem's in simply being the frig serious period. What'd you expect? Always remember this, small problems from mighty problems grow. <laughs> a mystic asks his audience what is it that you picture will be gained even if you do unravel a puzzle that is purely imaginary and the name of that sermon is how come they ain't got no answer to that question if the unabating annotation if the unabating annotating is the individual illness then common knowledge is the public plague If the unabating, annotating is the individual illness, then common knowledge is the public plague. Just because everyone's sure that they're conscious of themselves doesn't prove that what they're conscious of is themselves. Many hint for those still in the dark. Preferences may be the light switch. Maxi hint for those still confused. The inner commentary is for sure. 
and today's limited health news. You get ill in public, but only well in private. One stranger had this, had this teaching to offer. Quote, open the door wide and let everybody in and you will be enlightened. You might as well assume this position since the door is already open and you can never close it. Many maxim. Being more conscious is making the absolute most of what you have. Is it not? There was once a man involved in activities such as this who one day thought, if I actually was as awake as I talk, I'd be awake. Then after a moment further, mused, what if I am? And just haven't been aware of it. It's not impossible. I think we should leave that story about there and go on. A certain mystic, after being long badgered to put to paper what he understood, finally agreed to finally agreed and to what he wrote gave the title that continuing offensive activity. A mystic one day said to some listeners of like interest, once change has occurred in you, you must finally be cold and direct enough direct enough to take change to take charge yourself and change the change. That is, to go ahead and live as though the change has had its fullest possible effect on you. And after having said this, someone asked, How can you tell that such a time has finally arrived for you? And the mystic replied, If you feel the need to ask, the time has come. A man came to hear the words of a renowned mystic, only to be told that he had just died. And as he stood beside the still body of the wise one, he asked a mourner, What did he say when he was alive? And suddenly the mystic raised up and replied, Too much. <laughs> one guy says he sometimes wonders, What happened? I told you there was going to be a... One, back to the news. One guy says he sometimes wonders if... An enlightened man is just an everyday kind of person who at one time believed himself otherwise and after a great deal of effort realized the truth. <laughs> he says the only reason this disturbs him is as applies in his own case. Conversation overheard between two would-be mystics. It can't be as simple as it sounds. Nothing's that simple. What do you mean nothing's that simple? Hell, everything's that simple. Pause. Well, hell, if everything's that simple, you realize what that means about what we've been trying to do? Pause. Ah, damn. The end. <laughs> to be of ordinary irrelevant consciousness that is to be asleep captive and in the dark is to forever confuse the ending of things with the beginning of things and finally headline to be awake to be awake is to be a cloudless sky After the last several days of me talking about, uh, specifically again, the inner commentary and pointing out all of the ways in which you could look at it as being a detriment, an absolute barrier, to tell the truth, uh, or a manifestation, a characteristic of your lack of being more conscious. We can call it a barrier, but it's not that that one thing causes it. But in general, of me pointing out the negative aspects of the running inner commentary, the annotating that the mind does having to do with life. And after doing that for the last several days, someone sent me a telegram, I think, <laughs> called me, wrote me, demanding to know how I could say that when it was only a few 
months ago that I again pointed out that there was a usable method uh, of attempting to do something with your own attention, your own running commentary, and that was to give a running inner commentary describing your physical life. That is, that you're saying to yourself, I am not holding coffee, I'm about to put my left hand. Of course, you can't do it all, you do what's possible. I'm about to put my left hand in my pocket and I'm raising the cup a little bit while I'm talking and I'm going to stop right here for a second and sip it. I cut my eyes off to the left and I slurped a little and now I got it back down. The person wrote and said, how could I have recommended that, which I have on more than one occasion as a method, as something to do. Now I'm going to scratch the left side of my cheek. Now stop it. <laughs> how I could have done that and then say what I have said about the commentary and to point out that uh, all that you cannot have mental preference, which is useless, which is irrelevant, which is a distinct, a salient, an unavoidable characteristic and proof of an ordinary state of consciousness that you can't even have that without commenting internally, without the running commentary. So how could I encourage someone to give a running commentary of their own physical, just minutely, just whatever you can observe, the minute, mundane activities of your body, and then denounce, trounce, and dropkick the running commentary the way I have for the last several nights. They won't know how I can do that. Well, you were listening. You just do it. You open your mouth and you go, blah, 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 and you do it. Kind of damn faxes and telegrams. Western Union shouldn't. It's not my business. I don't have any stock. But places like Western Union, I used to think the post office, but I know that there are certain logistics problems. But it seems to me that these kinds of responsible, or assumed to be responsible institutions, and of course at one time the post office was a direct subdivision of our government. And so at one time I thought that the post office should look at each and every postcard, communique, personal letter, and see if it made any sense. See if it was irrational. Like, like this guy writing me. I know it may have seemed rational to him, but it's ridiculous. The man doesn't understand anything, and I, so I thought the post office should take letters like that and have somebody in charge that knew what they were doing to read each one and look at that and go, that's a waste of time and to send it back to the guy who wrote it. I do know they, they, they have a lot of mail and et cetera, and now they're not even part of the government, so it's not like you can get your congressman to introduce a bill to do it. But um, look, faxes, somebody should do something. They, sh they should not allow that kind. They might understand that. I assume you know I wasn't talking about the post office and letters. I was talking about what goes on to communicate between what appears to be your thinking and what appears to be your consciousness. Or you're listening to me speaking for ordinary thinking and then say something like that. And then to make up a story of somebody writing me and pointing out that they detect conflicts, irreconcilable ideas that uh, I denounce inner commentary and then give a method of how a man might use it. And then I say somebody wrote me. Nobody wrote me. If they did, I wouldn't read a letter like that. I was speaking on behalf of your ordinary mind, everyone's ordinary mind, of it saying such as that, which is simply a continuation of the commentary. Where do you expect it's going to go? Are you going to trap somebody? Are you going to trap me, another person? Are, have you ever trapped anybody? Does anybody ever notice that you cannot trap another person? You can't even trap the ordinary people who believe in spirits and ghosts and gods. They can't even trap God. They can't back him in a corner. Why? The mind has no corner. There is no dead end to the mind. There is no wall against which you can finally take thought, the running commentary, and push it against and say, look at yourself. Just look at the sorry mess you, look how illogical, how... Look how insane, look how irrelevant you are. It can't be done. Does anyone find that interesting? I do. Shut up.
Can you picture this scene? A man inside a structure trying to break out and outside another guy trying to break in. Does anybody know that that's exactly what I just got through talking about? As unreasonable as it may have verbally sounded to some, that's exactly what we're talking about. Do you not at times when you're attempting to in whatever way you look at it, to do something with your own inner commentary, to stabilize your own consciousness, to stop the running of thought, to try and just be aware of what's going on? Can you not feel that at times it's as though you're, we could describe it as it feels like you're trying to break out of something? But then at other times or at the same moment, can you not see, feel, Perhaps will be a better word, sense, that you're also attempting to break into something. The spatial direction of breaking in or breaking out is irrelevant. It is the point that what you're dealing with of trying to achieve another state of consciousness, so-called enlightenment, etc., is that you're trying to get through what amounts to a barrier, a wall. It doesn't exist, but there it is. My illusionary correspondent that asked how I could uh, have used the inner commentary as a potential method of observing and describing to oneself what one is doing physically. And how I could use that and at the same time point out that uh, th as long as the commentary is running, you cannot change your state of consciousness. That wall is what appears to be the verbalization of the mind. Because you can go back to my suggestion of using a method of describing to yourself what's going on. You can do exactly what I did about, well, I'm going to fold my arms and I'm going to unfold them and put them behind my back. You can do that non-verbally to yourself. You can do the same thing. And to do that is, to carry my own allegory further, is really pushing on the wall. But you can describe to yourself what you're doing without verbally, even internally, without verbally describing to yourself what you're doing. Take that, correspondent. Just because everyone's sure that they're conscious of themselves doesn't mean that what they're conscious of is themselves. Okay. All ordinary people, of course, believe that they're conscious of themselves. And it does us no good. There is no real basis. There's no useful basis to argue that and to say they're wrong and only a few select people, such as you and maybe me, sometimes know better what people ordinarily mean of being conscious of themselves is not really debatable, not usefully. You ask somebody, are you conscious of yourself? And they go, yes. And that's the end of that story. They're conscious of something when asked about it. That is, we all are. I ask, you know, are you conscious of yourself? Forget any extraordinary state of consciousness. Forget anything out of the routine. Are you conscious of yourself? And you go, well, yes. People interested in this would be inclined, their desire would be to suddenly add, quickly add something else, like, well, I'm conscious of myself, but not satisfied with. But you are conscious of yourself at the same level as everyone else, in the same manner. Yes, I am. Everyone has been saying for thousands of years and writing about being conscious of yourself. That is an opening statement. It's, again, one of these extremely severe truisms. So much so that it's beyond truism, as I said, there's no real word for it. It is just, it is a operating part, not just verbally, but it is an operational part of the foundation of thought. That it's an opening of a sentence that doesn't even need to be said. When people believe that they're involved with anything resembling deep thought, insightful pondering, 
They are saying that they're conscious of themselves. They're saying, this is me pondering. This is me, Plato, writing this. This is me, Buddha, saying this. This is me, Lao, musing this to myself or passing this along to someone else. But you're saying, I am conscious of me. I know what I am saying. I am saying something or I'm thinking something that is of some value. And the unsaid part, the opening of all of that is always, I am conscious of me. I am self-conscious. Because if someone starts talking, even though I say it's tacit, if someone starts saying, if someone said, let me explain to you, I'm going to tell you what happens after you die. Or I'm going to tell you what the reality of God is. Or I'm going to tell you why men operate, why men behave as they do. And you go, wait a minute. I'd love to hear it, but first, you are self-conscious. You're conscious of yourself. And as soon as you get them over thinking you're crazy, they understand. They go, we, certainly. And you go, well, I just, you are conscious of yourself right now. And if you could do it without them thinking something very strange was going on, they, in fact, would be inclined to say that, yes, I am. And, in fact, uh, what I was about to say to you, getting into such a serious area, I was, in fact, right on the verge of being even more conscious because I am really reflecting, taking my time, what I was about to say to you because it is indeed a solemn matter. And so what you're asking, yes, I was conscious of myself. When what they mean, at least in that context, if you follow it, was that they are, now that you've mentioned it, that they are giving even more attention to their attention. That I am not letting my mind wander. Now that I'm going to speak to you on such a serious matter, I am extremely conscious of myself. I am conscious of what I'm saying. I don't want to misspeak. I don't want to mislead you. I have thought on this for a long time, and I want to try and present it to you in as coherent a manner as possible. So the person would say, I am extremely I'm not only conscious of myself like everyone else, any sane person, but I am extremely so. What is it that people are conscious of when they say it? When I say people, I mean everybody, you. When you say, if I say, is everybody in the world self-conscious, conscious of themselves? I don't mean self-conscious in the embarrassment, in the sense of being embarrassed, but is everyone conscious of themselves, all sane, ordinary Neurally wired up people, routinely wired up neurally, are all ordinary people conscious of themselves? You would say yes. Everyone would say yes. Every ordinary person on this planet would say yes. And I go, you're sure you're conscious of yourself? And you go, well, yes. I mean, there's no question. You just go, yeah, you kind of turn, maybe cut your eyes up is what I was trying to display. And you go, yes. You're aware of something when they ask. But what is it you're aware of? Why does everyone say that they're conscious of themselves? Who's ever proved that? How do you know that yourself? No one ever asked. Not that there's an immediate answer, but no one asked. You are certainly conscious of something. And I will point out again, I'm not trying to play with words. This has to do with the possibility of you being in a place wherein you should consider that if you haven't moved recently that you perhaps have, are overlooking something. That perhaps there is a radical flaw in your present picture of what's going on. All you've got to do is take the idea, as I just said, of ordinary people who would say, yes, I am conscious of myself. Everyone involved with this always assumes after some length of time they operate on the basis that I am past the normal. Maybe I'm not any better off right now. I am not really more permanently enlightened. But at least I know the difference between just saying, yeah, I'm conscious of myself because I'm not only conscious of myself. I'm speaking on behalf of people such as would be interested in this. That their view, if I may be so bold as to present it, would be not only am I conscious of myself, I am conscious of being conscious of myself and all the shortcomings pertinent thereto. I'm not only conscious of myself now that you ask me in the ordinary sense, but I'm conscious of the fact that very often, perhaps most of the time, I am not instantly, contemporaneously conscious of myself. I'm not conscious of my consciousness. 
In other words, it sounds like, well, by God, you're making metaphysical progress. And even I've described it. If we're just going to talk about it, that is certainly beyond the experience that 99% of the world's population has or will ever or heretofore has ever had. People are not conscious of their own consciousness. And they don't even think about being conscious of themselves, really, unless asked. That's about the only way that it happens. That someone's actually asked, or they might be reading about some study on the nature of the what is consciousness is related to the brain. They might be reading some article or some book or listening to a lecture, and they might momentarily reflect on that and give it some thought. But about the only time that people are would even have give any attention to the idea of being conscious. And you can't really just say, are you conscious? It doesn't make much sense. The, the general expression is why I used it is are, that people believe without any doubt that they are conscious of themselves. You're going to find and make me on. Is that what you're trying to do? About the only way that people would have anything to say about it is if or it makes any particular sense is you would can't just say, are you conscious? You would have to ask people, are you conscious of yourself? And they say yes. Then people who get involved with this believe that there is not only that once it's pointed out and once they observe the matter for themselves, that they read or someone points out to them that everyone believes they're conscious of themselves, but it is not a continuing constant state within a man. Do we all know that what you call being conscious of yourself or being called conscious, once you begin to look at it, is tied directly to what appears to be the external world, external conditions of some kind, whether they be tangible and physical in front of you or not, or your recollection of them. Is that your consciousness is just continual. It might as well be tied to something. might as well be tied to a string, and it's out there in the world, and you can't really see particularly what it's tied to. It's just jerked about, and you go here and there. And so once you observe some of that, or it's pointed out to you in that way, people who get involved with this would later, again, I submit, I'm giving a reasonable description, would later be inclined to say this, or at least agree to it, that not only are they self-conscious of themselves in the same way everybody else is, which after you study the matter at all, you realize that that just means that you are, your brain is operating and talking to you and your eyes open. The people involved with such as this would say, or agree to it, that not only am I conscious of myself, same as everybody else, but I am now conscious of this, when I can remember to be, I am conscious of this, that I am not normally, consistently, constantly conscious of myself. I know I can be, but I am not. Because what we're calling consciousness is normally tied to random events, it seems, or random events in my head that it just bounces around and I really have no control over it. If you ask me, are you conscious of yourself? Or are you conscious of consciousness? If you ask me right this second, I go, yeah. But I've been around enough that I'm aware that that is not my normal state. And it is certainly not ordinary men's normal state. They're not even aware of that. Or if you point out to them, even if they say, well, yeah, I see what you mean, but so what? And that's the end of that. But people who get involved with this after a certain length of time and some experience and some knowledge in it, would be inclined to say, or agree to me saying it, that yes, I am, a, I am conscious of myself, the same as everyone else, but I also have an additional awareness now that I am, that I and everyone else, but that I specifically am not continually conscious of myself, and it's at least a slight misnomer for me to say I am conscious of myself. I should say I'm partially conscious of myself. I should say I'm conscious of myself when I can remember to be. And you go on and on and on and on and on. Here's the new question of the day, though. All right, you're conscious of something, or you even say, well, you're conscious of something at another level, that I'm not only conscious of myself in the ordinary sense, the same as everybody else who's not really conscious of themselves, unless asked, but I'm conscious of myself, same as everyone else, but I am also conscious of myself not being conscious of myself consistently. <laughs> and that sounds as though, well, by God, you're this, you know, you're this close to living in Buddha's neighborhood. You're this close you know, to being sitting on the amen bench with Abraham, Zoroaster, except for this. The question is still valid. 
you are certainly conscious of something the same as the most ordinary person who has no interest in anything extraordinary on this planet who would say, I am conscious of myself and that's that. You are still faced with this question. They are conscious of something or they couldn't say that. They wouldn't say it. But to say you're conscious of yourself, that's no proof that what you're conscious of is in any manner yourself. And yourself, the words, I know that to ordinary people, if they were listening at all, would probably get their attention since the term is conscious of yourself. And I say, well, there's no proof that even if you are conscious of something, if we give you that, there's no proof that it's yourself. Scratch yourself. If you're getting good, you're conscious of something, but let's put it this way. You don't know what it is. It's too easy. Well, I say that, and I guess you'll decide for yourself. Now that I'm about to try to describe something I never tried before. It is too easy. It is easier to make a statement. I'm a little off sidetrack in case you're trying to piece it all together. L listen to this as though it's just a, a sidebar that we stop the tape from that and I'm just saying this off to the side. Try this. This, I'm going to make two statements about the same thing. The first statement is the easiest. Is what I'm saying it's almost uh, insulting, or it should be to you, but now the first statement, the first version, they're the same statement, the first version is this. Just because men say that they're conscious of themselves doesn't prove that what they're conscious of is themselves. Here's the second version. Here's the non-insulting. Here's the advanced version. This is the basic version. Same thing. Just because men say that they're conscious of themselves doesn't prove that what they're conscious of doesn't prove that they know what they're conscious of. <laughs> See, by me negatively identifying it, by me saying that ordinary people say they're conscious of themselves, and then for me to say, yeah, they're conscious of something, but just because they say it's themselves, that doesn't mean it is themselves. So I point out exactly what it is that it may not be. But that's cheating. That makes you think you're getting somewhere. That makes the sentence sound like it is getting somewhere. And there's nowhere to get. But the sentence sounds like it has a setup. It's almost like a joke. That it has a setup. It has a premise. It says people think blah, 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 blah. But just because they think that, ha, ha, ha. It doesn't prove that blah, blah, blah is true. And you refer back to the thing that they said was true. And that makes you feel like, well, the sentence had a beginning and an end. If you want to know, uh, I don't guess I got around to it, it was a news item in there, that ordinary irrelevant consciousness, just being asleep, being in the dark, being just ordinary, can be described as this, as you continue to confuse beginnings of things with endings, with the ending of things, or vice versa. Those kind of sentences, those kind of ideas, and the reason I got off the track for this is if any of you can hear this, you ought to be doing it to yourself. The things that you're sure you know. If you notice, they're always that kind of sentence. Uh, that you can say, well, everybody else believes. Or I used to believe that so-and-so was true, but now I say it's not true. But you take the specific, such as the first version, that pe just because people believe that they are, that everyone as assumes, they believe, they accept, that they are conscious of themselves. That doesn't mean that what they're conscious of is themselves. If you agree with it or whatnot, the Senate seems to have a premise, it sets you up, and then it goes, yeah. But just because they believe it's themselves doesn't mean it's themselves. It's too easy. It's too distracting. It makes you feel as though that circular consciousness actually went somewhere. Which is part of the purpose of words, it is part of the trick of the mind, is that to make such a statement which can operate when you're dealing with externals in the sense of technology, in the sense that to actually manipulate something physically, and the only time people do that is when it has some specific bearing on survival. But when it has nothing to do with it, when it's in the secondary realm, when it's all imagination, if you start off a sentence talking about God, and then you end up talking about God, it feels like you got somewhere, either proving something or disproving something, or talking about art. 
that just because they just because most people say that a certain form of painting is the best type doesn't mean that that particular kind of painting is the highest form of art or of painting. It doesn't matter whether you agree with it or disagree with it. The sentence seemed to have gone somewhere. It seemed to have pointed to something that you could track in life. That Well, I may not agree with it, but I see what that means. If you think that you see what anything means, you're still asleep. Nothing means anything. And to think that something means something just because the sentence sounds good, especially when it gets into the area of apparent mysticism and think, well, now we're getting somewhere. Now we're dealing with ideas that are truly esoteric, metaphysical. Words are words. Bullshit's bullshit. You can, put a, you can paint a halo around a pile of bullshit. And you can call it whatever you want to, but it doesn't change it. And so the kinds of sentences, the first version, that just because everyone believes that they are conscious of themselves does not mean that what they're conscious of is themselves. What you should be doing when you think anything, if you're following this to yourself, anything that you're just sure of, it just seems obvious. You can always be more obvious. You can always take away the non-obvious, non-obvious part, which is a flaw in it, and that would be the version of my same sentence that would say, just because everyone believes that they are conscious of themselves does not prove in any way that they know what it is they're conscious of. That's the version. That's the version just before silence. Does anybody hear that to, to the mind, to ordinary thought, that last sentence uh, certainly makes sense. The sentence makes sense. But compared, after you've heard the first sentence, after you heard me describe what I was talking about, the second sentence all but does not make sense. In other words, the mind would go, well, why did you change it? The second version makes sense, but compared to what you were trying to say, it, it really doesn't make sense. I do not see the purpose in you putting it that way. Why does the mind say that? Because it made, you might say, one turn of the merry-go-round. When you came back, you didn't seem to be exactly where you expected to be. There seemed to be a... Once you knew the purpose of what I was saying, it, then the sentence itself seemed to have a verbal flaw. But any time that you can see a... And I say a verbal flaw, that would be a flaw from ordinary views. And so anytime you can find a flaw from an ordinary view, that means it's where you should be looking for the flaw in your extraordinary view. You get ill in public, but only well in private. You get self-conscious. Even though you don't learn it and it's no one's fault, to make it easy, you learn it. You learn, you pick up the inner commentary, which is say you pick up consciousness publicly, which is to say collectively, which is to say you had no choice. But you cannot get well collectively. Everyone, if we call ordinary state of consciousness the illness, the running commentary, the manifestation of the illness, then everyone gets sick publicly. If you grew up privately, if you grew up out in the woods by yourself, you'd never get sick. You'd never be common. You'd never be ordinary. You wouldn't have a dog's chance. You'd have a wolf boy's chance. <laughs> then you got to hope that some Frenchman with a literary bent... <laughs> You get sick, using that strictly allegorically. Everyone gets sick, publicly, collectively. That's how you get sick, is to be ordinary. But there is no way to get well, collectively. Uh, there are two levels, at least of that. Someone could be hearing that, if you heard it, that had any proclivity to the allegorical and think that they got it. And say, and here would be one version of it right quick, but I want to show you that a version that seems to be indeed extraordinary is never extraordinary enough. There's never 
has never been maxed out extraordinarily. To say that you only get ill publicly and only get well in private, anyone with any sort of ability to think non-linearly in areas that we normally talk of, speak of, could say, well, I understand that. That is, we all go to sleep. We all get in a normal state of consciousness through the ordinary environment, through being around our peers, our family, just the mass of humanity. Since they're not interested in it, we end up with that kind of illness. And so what you're saying is, the only way to get well is you cannot look for the same crowd, the same environment that made you ill to cure you. That you cannot go out and expect the government, religion, organized religion, education. You cannot go back to the collective. You cannot go back to the herd of humanity. And in any way, not because they wish you ill, they're just not interested. They're the ones who made you sick. And so you cannot go back to them and look for a cure. Sounds like a metaphysical sermon to me. That's, that's duck shit. That's child's play. It's true. But so what? Anyone who was still, anyone who would consider that it's a major breakthrough to realize that life, or the people outside you, en masse, institutions, organizations, just humanity in general, anyone who is now discovering that there may be a dearth of joy there. There may be a scant degree, if any, of possible assistance, even interest in your plight. Welcome to the 20th century. Where have you been? So that was dramatic sarcasm to say that that is child's play. Although there are many people who would consider that that would be a major breakthrough. Even, we'll assume now that you are past that point of being subject to that kind of blistering, and may I say, insightful sarcasm. Thank you. Let's say that you're past that point. Do you not engage in a similar fallacious activity internally? I'll speak on your behalf since it's short of time. Yes, you do. You look to the collective thoughts within you. You look to what you now believe has been the collective, or the cache of new ideas, of more insightful knowledge, secret information. You still look within the marketplace of your own thoughts. You're running commentary. You believe that you can differentiate in the same way that, back to the first level, that people at a fairly infantile level of discovery who are trying to awaken would finally, if they go far enough, would finally realize some truth some of the time in what I said that you get ill in public, but you can only get well in private, and they decide, yeah, I can see that. And so they would believe that they'd made some sort of progress if they quit uh, looking, expecting that there was going to be almost a random, accidental, readily available form of assistance to help them awaken out in life. That would normally, what happens, it would simply drive them to a sect, to a cult of some kind. I don't mean necessarily in a negative sense, but some small group of people, like a monastery. It would drive them more in their belief that there is a secret small group of people somewhere then we'll have to find maybe one guy or one little guy with a little community, some guru somewhere with a, that, that it's not going to be out there in the public place, that it will be in private. It will be, but to private to them, it's still not just themselves. If you get anywhere past that, and you, of course you, you can't even get anywhere past that constantly because if you did, you'd be awake and you wouldn't be listening to this. You'd be permanently awake. It's, You internally continue to look in the wrong place inside of you to get well. You look to the collective. There is, in other words, let me repeat the news item, the idea to start with, and I'm telling you this is totally valid. It's the only place that's really useful. It's where I intended it to be took. All in your head, all right in there, and now listen to it. You get sick, you get ill in public, but only well in private. All of that is in here. That's the only where 
that it's remotely useful. As I said out here, if you find that useful or if you find that revealing, uh, God, catch up. The only place that it is personally useful to anybody is there. And every word that I said, the whole reality behind what I said, the reason I wrote it and made up the idea of the sentence is in your head. It doesn't have anything to do with grooves or groups of people or whether you're trying to look at some large mystical or religious or spiritual organization or you decide it's got to be a smaller one. All that is just irrelevant. That's just you're just chasing your tail. It's just a hobby. You get ill in public. In here. And of course, by ill, I simply mean that to switch metaphors in mid-garden, as Jehovah told Adam, get out. And he got outside the gate, and there was the public. Don't worry about it, he was the only person. As soon as he got outside the gate, he was the public. He was the collective. That is, you're conscious. Once you get outside the gate, you're in public. There's no, you're in public, and so you're ill, from our view. Strictly metaphorical, of course. But the illness is your ordinary condition. You get ill in public. There is no such thing as a private ill. It's only in public. Ordinary people who believe they're private ills, which is to believe that you're mentally deranged. That you individually uh, became mentally ill. We're not talking about genetic brain damage or physical brain damage. We're talking about so-called serious or psych uh, psychotic mental conditions that you individually got ill you know, based upon uh, some trauma, based upon your environment when you were a child, and et cetera. That's outside the norm. Even the public recognizes that. But what I'm telling you is all of it is in private, but it appears to be in public. But once you get past looking out there for anything, because it's not that out there doesn't exist or that nothing happens out there, but what happens in you is the same thing that happens out there in versa vice. You got ill in public. As soon as you got conscious, you were ill. But it happened publicly. I know this may not be striking all of you as making a lot of immediate sense. We keep saying public and private, but it does. I, there's, I mean something. You got sick. You get ill. Everyone does publicly. But you can't get well publicly. In there. And that it takes, it takes much effort to see, at least what I mean by it, behind the word public and private. Because inside your skull you can think, well, it's just me. So it's not me. It's not me and a bunch of public. I, I'm, I'm trying not to even think about other people's ideas. I'm trying to forget things I read about how to be more conscious. I'm trying to just do it myself. I'm trying to just turn my own attention back on me and pull up on my own reserves and reservoirs of what I've experienced and understand. I know, I know, no, 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 no. You can only get well privately. Privately is beyond conditions. You can't be semi-private. If you don't, if private's not it, how about individually? To speak of somebody as an individual, or for you to think of yourself as I am an individual, you don't think of yourself conditionally. You don't picture you individually, but it's you plus about 20% uh, of uh, Francis, your wife. You don't, you don't, it's not you individually, and there's some sort of growth on the side of you mm -hmm. that's your brother, your mother, some friend, your husband, your wife, an individual. Is unconditional. It just, it's just you. That's the only way to get well. End up with one other way of putting it. If you can see just you in you, you're well. Then you don't have to worry about well, what does all that thing mean about getting ill in public and you keep pointing in here. If you can see just you in there, if you can be private, if you can turn around and be privately you, you're awake. Or at least you're with the idea that I'm asleep. Now you're in a crowd. 
a real noisy crowd. <laughs> you can be in a noisy crowd. I guess you already got it. Having spent 40 years sitting alone, silently, in a monastery, meditating. 